you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave and Merry Christmas with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is our podcast for Christmas Day, December 25th, 2022. Merry Christmas to both of you. And to you. And to you. And to our listeners. And to our listeners. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, all. Very happy day. So Christmas falls on a Sunday this year, as I think most of our listeners discovered at least back in September. And here it is. And our texts are Isaiah 62, 6 through 12, Psalm 97, Titus 3, 4 through 7, and Luke 2, essentially 1 through 20. There's different options for Christmas, and we are going to rebroadcast an old podcast that covers the Christmas setting with the John 1 gospel text and others. But because we simply can't resist and because we did Luke 2 for Christmas Eve, we're going to talk a little bit about John 1, 1 through 14. And I'm going to get out in front of my colleague Caroline and say, you really should read through verse 18. <laughs> but if you're interested in Luke 2 and you're saying, where's that? Uh, do listen to our Christmas Eve broadcast podcast where we talk about that as well. It's a tough day, right, for preachers. You've preached last night, most likely, and now you're preaching again this morning, and it's tiring. So, yeah. For those of you who are really exhausted, I just talked with a colleague who is preaching 10 services, and they're doing all of them. So, mm -hmm. whoa. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we talked about this for the podcast uh, for Christmas Eve, but. Just to remind, and I, I tell this to uh, our students, Joy, too, that just to remind preachers that their sermon doesn't have to do it all, that they, that, that they realize that they're part of a larger whole, the way in which the carols, the Christmas carols are each their own sermons. And so maybe that will take a little bit of a load off that that Christmas is not we've talked about this that Christmas is not about explaining and and uh and laying out the doctrine of the incarnation or anything like that it's just it's it's experiencing the announcement in your time and place on in your field with your sheep and and uh and and so that and that you you take that you take all of the, that announcement that hastening to uh, to see the baby and in the manger and you ponder all of that and so this yeah so a sermon doesn't have to have this long you know explication of the text it's just drop in somewhere uh, or where is it that you can invite people to that that act of pondering i think um i was just in the holy land a couple of weeks ago well about a month ago now and the what's so interesting about the uh about the sites in the holy land you know what we waited a long time in line to, for the church of the nativity to see you know the manger or the place where jesus was born and where jesus was laid and uh and of course you if you've ever been there you know you have about like 2.3 microseconds to actually <laughs> to actually be there or touch it and you, and then they're like you know moving you along uh so there's not a whole lot of contemplation and pondering that happens with you when you see it but we still go we still we still are the ones who hasten to that manger we're all still here even though we were here christmas eve and christmas day we still come to uh to hear the story again and to hear the carols and uh, and so uh, don't take any of that for granted that we're that we're still making that pilgrimage to be able to be close to this uh, unexplainable event uh, and this word becoming flesh. And so, um, yeah, that's part of what I've been thinking about for today. Yeah, this is a this is um, I, I talk about uh, uh, in our class the role of uh, the preacher as a prophet pastor and priest. And um, when, I, when I talk about that, you know, we, we think of the prophet as the one who speaks the words. We um, think of uh, the pastor as the one who's caring um, and the priest around the sacraments. But 
I want to follow up with what you've just said, Caroline, to remind us that that priestly role is carrying on the rituals um, and, and the leadership role that we have um, is to be able to say to folks, this generation deserves the same awe, the same urgency, the same wonder, uh, the same uh, affirmation. Um, or as you, you spoke when we were uh, uh, in um, uh, Christmas Eve, um, comfort and joy that previous generations have experienced. And so it might seem familiar to us because we've listened to these sermons all of our life and now it's our job to preach them, but that's just it. It's our job to hold this festival so that those who come together find a community rehearsing a promise that has been made real and can experience it through word, through song, through prayer, through smell, um, through sound, um, just to make it come alive. And I hope that I hope that enables some of us as we're preparing uh, for uh, Christmas yet again to get all excited um, one more time because this is this is the day. And for I don't know for that couple who's first toddler or for that, um, that couple that just, you know, got married, or for the person that this is the first without a family member like you, Caroline. Um, we need to experience the joy of this festival and, and move with it again. As I, think about, as I think about Christmas this year with it falling on a Sunday, I think People will know who may or may not be coming, but it's it's a good day for hospitality, yes. for thinking of Christmas in terms of how what do, what does it mean to create a hospitable place, not just for Jesus to come, but to think about Christmas in that regard. Because there'll be people there who have lost family, or people whose family can't be with them, or people who aren't maybe sure why they are there. I mean, it'd be an interesting mix of people who come on a on a Sunday morning presumably after they've been there the night before. And sometimes it has to do with loss and sometimes that has to do with disappointment. Sometimes it has to do with nowhere else to go, those types of, of things. And so just to think about how you set the stage for that. And especially when I think of like both the John one text, and if you're doing that setting, even the Hebrews one text, where you've got these, these cosmic vistas in both of those um, of a God who nevertheless wants to be known, right? You've got this tremendous um, contrast between, you know, the holy, the magnificent, the infinite, you know, the inaccessible with then the idea of a God who takes on human flesh, right? And who dwells among us. And that, that's where I would take kind of as my starting point, right? What does it mean to have Christ as a neighbor, as a friend, um, you know, which can get really trite in a hurry if you're not careful, I realize. But but to, to do something like that, to not make assumptions that everybody who's there is happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the that's part of the promise of the incarnation. You know, the word became flesh, which means the word knows the entirety of what God knows. Jesus knows the entirety of what it means to be human mm -hmm. and that whatever feelings, whatever you're experiencing, uh, uh, those are all known um, and heard and experienced by God. And uh, that, that truly is the promise of, of what John talks about, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the word became man, the word became flesh. And, uh, and so that we kind of um, mm, dwell deeply in that promise of and that and that reality and we're not alone um in what we're what we're experiencing and as you said matt you know that i love eugene peterson so word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood so jesus is your neighbor jesus is your friend uh but of course the verb is you know to tent or to tabernacle and that promise that john is making that from the wilderness wanderings that your God is with you. Your God will go wherever you go and will tent among you and be with you. And, 
And that going does not necessarily, when we think on Christmas, does not necessarily have to be a place. It's where do you go emotionally? Where do you go spiritually? Where do you go uh, in theologically, God is going to go with you on that. Uh, God is going to be there in those, in those explorations and those travels and those journeys. And so that's, uh, that's, that's part of, you know, it's, that is the promise of Christmas. This is the promise fulfilled. This is, you know, th there's the way that John describes this is so familiar. I mean, we know the familiarity of it, but we also read John in how John is rehearsing words, ideas, you know, to tent, to dwell, to tabernacle, uh, to be with us as God was through the wilderness. You, you, you hit on all of those, Caroline. That is just a rehearsal of the promise-making God where God has shown up in the past and now, after what is recorded as 300 years of silence, God shows up and actually moves in to the zip code to suffer as we suffer, to um, live as we live, to be tempted as we are tempted, to take on flesh, but also to, to show us what it looks like to bear the image of God. And that, that God would start so simply. What is the promise of a baby? You know, that, that there's the awe and wonder of, of this baby who can do absolutely nothing and yet changes everything. I mean, whether it's your first child or your fifth child, <laughs> a baby changes everything. And that's exactly what the birth of Jesus does. It changed everything. We often talk about the resurrection as changing everything, that history was changed when Jesus rose from the dead. History was changed when God took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And that's the, that's the awe that needs to be conjured up again when we tell this story, whether we're telling it from Luke or we're telling it from John. And if, if we can live in the midst of the realities of our moment, but capture this promise that has been made real in the least expected way, mm -hmm. uh, going back to Luke, to the least expected audience, not the shepherds, mm -hmm. you and me, we're the audience. Mm -hmm. And God is showing up to show us that his promises are true, and that changes everything. Mm -hmm. I think, too, that the, uh, the way in which that showing up, that changing thing, <laughs> that changing thing, the, the, the everything being changed, right? And I totally agree with you on that, that a lot of Christian theology has put all of its chips in cross and resurrection and, and in a lot of ways ignored the the saving power, the transformational power of incarnation. Totally agree with that. As well as the, I also would want to emphasize the surprise in that we've got in the Isaiah 62 text, uh, severe impatience <laughs> and demanding from God. Uh, and I think in some ways, if you're doing the other setting, even the, uh, the Isaiah 52, seven through 10 text kind of works with this about keeping watch and demanding and people were demanding, you know, what those texts describe is an insistence that God act, that God do something. And the response is God sends God's own self, mm -hmm. which is also the surprise, right? This is one of the things that makes Christianity, uh, I think, if not unique, at least incredibly distinctive among, among the religions that God doesn't send some, an intermediary or a, or a lieutenant or something like that. But what does it mean that this is God's own self, which again, also ties in, I think, to, to things like Psalm 97 and the praise there about the Lord being King, because then it becomes, well, what kind of King, right? This is just, what, who are we talking about? And how does the, how does the incarnation 
in the way in which Jesus became incarnate, as opposed to just all of a sudden a 30 year old man showing up saying, Hey everybody, you know, but, but <laughs> is a quote unquote ordinary human being who comes into the world in the ordinary way is, is that kind of a King, right? That demands a re now a reassessment of all of these assumptions that we might've had about who is God, what kind of God, but also how will God act in the world? And so then what should we be praying for? What should we be hoping for? What should we be insisting on? And that's, I think that's where we, we hear those promises in the Titus text too, that. Oh, give it up for Titus. This is Titus's Titus. favorite time of year. I know, <laughs> but you know, the goodness and loving kindness of God, that that's another way to define the incarnation, uh, that the incarnation is God's mercy, that the incarnation is the spirit being poured out richly. Uh, th this incarnation is about justice and righteousness. Uh, and going back to something that you said, but well, you both were talking about it, that that emphasis then on the incarnation as a salvific act on the part of God, mm -hmm. that uh, I think has really, and those of those listeners know that I, that I think this is way underplayed in, in theological conversation because of our focus on the cross and resurrection. I'm all for cross and resurrection. Uh, but, uh, but the incarnation, and this is certainly true for John, is a salvific is salvation uh, for uh, for us, and so, what does it mean to locate being saved or our salvation, or even thinking about salvation in the incarnation? Um, that that it's and rather than or addition to you know forgiveness of sins that we typically equate with the cross, uh, but what does it mean? How do we, how how do we think about this differently? If this is actually a, uh, a an act of a saving God, a salvation on the part of God, that and that what does salvation feel like and mean when God, as you said, uh, Matt, God sends God's very self to be in solidarity with humankind, and uh, and that I think that invites a kind of theological imagination that we don't get to talk about, where, where we don't talk about as often as we should. And Christmas is a perfect time to do it. And Titus invites us to take on the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in that what it means for us to take on our identity as uh, heirs of Christ, that we indeed are image bearers of the creator, that that's what it means to be human. And so the incarnation shows us in flesh what it looks like to bear the image of God 24 seven in the world that we inhabit. And I think that's, that's pretty incredible news. So it's not, it's a promise to us now. So as we anticipate um, heaven, as we anticipate eternal life, um, we get a glimpse of it because God has shown us in taking on human flesh what it looks like to love, what it looks like to forgive, what it looks like to heal, what it looks like to receive the neighbor, the stranger, the foreigner. All of the things that God has listed in the commands for Israel to be is now by the Spirit poured out on us. And Jesus is the example who not only shows us, but makes it possible for us to be what God created us to be. Amen. We should end with uh, just a brief note to our listeners that it's always a, an honor to be a part of helping or at least kickstarting some of your, your Christmas homiletical imagination. So thank you for that. And Merry Christmas. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of uh, our conversations and allowing us to be a part of yours. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.